It's a coronavirus that shut down the world economy. Now, will it be an energy crunch that stops the recovery in its tracks? Europeans who scoffed at Britain's post-Brexit shortage of fuel truckers are no longer laughing as they watch their natural gas bills go through the roof. And just as uh, COVID exposed how vulnerable humanity's become to oh-so-taught global supply chains for such basics as pharmaceuticals and face masks, those same supply chains are now out of whack, what with the whole world putting in factory orders at the same time. We'll ask about blackouts in China, coal shortages in India, bidding wars for liquefied natural gas from Qatar, and claims that Russia's leveraging its own gas exports to apply political pressure. If Europe's so heavily dependent on natural gas, well, it's because, in part, it's been touted as the great bridging energy, a least work worst stopgap option to help our planet transition from fossil fuels to renewables. The current energy crunch comes amidst a climate emergency with urgent calls to hasten that transition. How? And how to make it through the coming winter? Today in the France 24 debate, is the recovery being nipped in the bud? Joining us from London, Henning Gloystein, Director for Energy and Climate uh, Resources at uh, the Eurasia Group Think Tank. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Bonsoir. From Goa in India, Sunil Dahia, analyst at the Center for Research on Energy and Clean Air. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Anne Créti, uh, welcome back, Director of uh, Climate, uh, the Climate Economics Chair at Paris Dauphine uh, University. And Thierry Bros, Professor at uh, the French Political Science Institute Sciences Po. You're a member of the EU-Russia Gas Advisory Council. Bonsoir. Yes. Welcome to the show. Uh, the uh, France 24 debate, where you can join the conversation, and you have, on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24 debate. Yes, supplies not keeping up with demand, gas, but also oil surging. The EU is exposed and it's scrambling. James Mulholland has more. Faced with soaring gas and electricity prices, Brussels wants to act swiftly. Its main strategy to rein in the hike, encouraging member states to lower VAT and other taxes on energy. The European Commission has backed a plan for direct handouts to households. An energy cashback scheme is to be set up, but it will only be available for those families that are most in need. The situation across Europe is serious. 36 million households have been hit by the skyrocketing prices. The EU's statistics office says energy prices rose 17.4 per cent in the month of September alone. And winter has not yet begun. A very bad scenario would be one indeed where you have an extremely severe winter in the northern hemisphere. So the demand for power uh, goes up quite a bit. At the same time, we don't resolve uh, the supply problems or the help it in the near term. Longer term, the European Commission also wants to head off future supply problems and is considering setting up strategic gas stockpiles. The details are expected to be unveiled mid-December. The burning issue of rising energy prices will be at the top of the agenda at the next summit of European heads of state and government, scheduled for late next week. So, Anna Kreti, we, we uh, now know that Europe can mutualize vaccine purchases. Can they mutualize gas purchases? Well, uh, this is possible if we uh, think about the uh, solutions that can be offered within the Union of Energy. Um, the fact of uh, uh, having solidarity across the states is the first point that could evolve through um, kind of uh, uh, common negotiations with, res with respect to uh, the countries where we uh, import uh, gas mainly. Uh, so the question is, uh, it is possible to go as far uh, to have to recreate uh, just a, a solution of uh, monopsony, that is uh, Europe as a single country and monopoly that is uh, Russia. I, I don't think so. I think that Russia is uh, start saying that mm, you, you do not have to worry, I have enough gas, I'm going to send it. Um, nor, also Norway uh, was uh, um, loaded down because of an accident that was uh, uh, hitting the, uh, the country a couple of months ago. And I think that now they can increase the supplies. Um, so this, uh, this idea of the uh, strategic stock of gas is not new. Uh, it has been um, already uh, discussed at the European level 
I would say 10 years ago, and uh, at that time, uh, the solution has been discarded. So I, I'm not sure that we are going to an extreme situation of having the uh, European gas bank. There won't be a European gas bank. No, I don't think so. Again, I'm, uh, I've, I've lived a few of those crises. I remember uh, 10 years ago, this was, again, the old trick on the table. It didn't fly. It's not going to fly today. And again, please remember that uh, Europe has been built on markets. Uh, and, and we've forced uh, others inside Europe and outside Europe to uh, move away from uh, monopolies. So it will be a bit of a, a strange idea to move back to a monopoly or monopsoly in, in Europe when we say to the others and the rest of the world, markets are the solution. Well, unless you're in a country like Spain, where right now you're heavily dependent on natural gas and uh, citizens are being really hit hard. Yes, it's true, but I don't think this uh, monopoly will work. I mean, a, again... Uh, Why not? Because perha perhaps also please remember that when you're buying big volumes, it doesn't mean it's going to be cheaper. And again, at the end of the day, who balances this supply demand? The supply demand needs to be balanced quite... Uh, uh, on, I wouldn't say on a timely le on, on a daily level, but on a timely level. And so therefore, I'm not so sure that civil servants will do this. All right. Uh, let's look at the broader picture here, because it, now it's not just natural gas since the last time Anna came on. Oil's above $80 a barrel for the first time in seven years. Record coal prices in China. And yeah, as for natural gas, since January, uh, they've risen 250%. Uh, percent. We can uh, see uh, uh, the graph there. Uh, Henning Gloystein, uh, is it just a perfect storm because everybody's putting in bids for factories at the same time and winter's coming in the northern hemisphere? Or is there something else at play here? Um, you're right to point to a perfect storm. There, there is a, a whole a host of reasons why energy prices have shot up. Uh, this time a year ago, most countries were in recession and about to lock down again. So uh, the demand side has picked up uh, since last year as well because stimulus-induced um, um, economic growth has picked up. On the supply side, a lot of producers, liquefied natural gas producers, um, uh, pipeline suppliers, have had production problems because of COVID, because of technical reasons. And in China, you have this massive household gasification program as part of which around 10 million households every year are moved from burning coal at home to natural gas. So every year now that it gets cold, uh, they go and um, uh, they, they need to burn a lot more gas, which China now has to import and uh, which has been driving up prices um, uh, every winter. I mean, we had actually an LNG price spike this time a year ago, um, which already affected uh, Asia. And because gas is now a pretty global market, uh, this is also spilling into into um, uh, Europe. And on the coal side, uh, yes, coal is probably in terminal uh, decline on the demand side because of climate policies. But it is very possible that the supply side is declining even faster than consumption because of uh, a lack of investment. So it's a pretty uh, big storm that's brewed up here. And uh, now it's getting winter and we're in a bit of a prickle. Uh, Henning Gloystein, uh, were you one of those who uh, up until recently touted natural gas as this wonder fuel, this, this bridging energy that will help us uh, do a soft landing from fossil fuels to renewable energy? Uh, not, not really. So the, the thing is, though, I, if you look at the current prices for natural gas, for coal, for electricity, uh, and for carbon prices in Europe, that sends you a pretty clear long-term signal to invest into local, clean, domestic uh, electricity supply and storage solutions. However, there is a role for gas to play, and I think this gets overlooked a little bit. Britain, which is in a particularly complicated position at the moment, uh, what has happened there is over the last decade, Britain has almost entirely phased out its coal-fired power um, generation fleet. This uh, gap that the coal industry has left has been um, needed to be met by the gas industry and the renewable industry. And uh, in both uh, sectors, there has not been in enough investment into inventories. This has been mentioned before. Um, and in the, in the renewable side, there are not yet the solutions at scale to back up renewables with other solutions like clean hydrogen or battery 
or that so, um, uh, uh, sort of uh, technology. So there is still a role for natural gas to play in, in this transition, and that has been overlooked in some places. Of the world. So, Neil Dehi, I'm, I'm haunted by something Henning just said, that uh, uh, there's been underinvestment uh, where there are coal plants uh, right now, even as they're phasing them out. You know, the, the, this Wednesday, the International Energy Agency, based in Paris here, put out its big report. One of the things it said was, from day one, governments should stop funding fossil fuels. Is that realistic? Oh, well, definitely. That, that, that's the uh, only solution to go ahead. And I think the current energy crisis all across uh, different countries, uh, including Europe, uh, uh, is a signal to that, that these fossil fuels day by day are making our energy systems more and more, more vulnerable to uh, uh, these kind of situations which we have faced right now. One, primarily because of uh, the climate uh, goals which we all have to achieve, the local environmental or human health problems which are caused by uh, air pollution, as well as uh, right now the economics of, of depending on fossil fuels is costing us a lot and even taking us to a situation where we are kind of heading towards the blackouts in major economies, take it India, uh, China, or, or even Europe. Uh, we actually did an assessment uh, last week, and what we found out was that the the gas bills uh, were avoided uh, by, 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 by the amount of about 33 billion euros only for Europe, uh, uh, because there was renewable energy which was supplying. Uh, enough of or, or, or a decent amount of electricity around the uh, time when July to September when the gas prices were at its peak highest. Now, assumingly, if renewable energy would not have been there, uh, we would have had 33 billion uh, euros uh, more uh, uh, spent out from the consumer's pocket uh, in terms of paying their, their, their bills. So right. that... that that, that so, Sunil, I'm going I'm to interrupt you just because we're, uh, the, we're having uh, uh, issues with the sound. We're going to try to have those fixed with you. Apologies for that and, and, uh, and try to get back to you as quickly as possible. I mentioned that International Energy Agency report. Uh, it, it, the boss, in an interview with the, Finan the Financial Times, calling for a tripling of public spending on renewables and again, a halt to taxpayer money for fossil uh, fuels. Uh, Fatih Birol saying uh, that uh, I I that uh, the current energy market disruption was because of a confluence of factors, including, quote, an unsustainable recovery from the pandemic, weather conditions and significant uh, gas supply uh, outages. When you do your reports, Anna, do you factor in uh, what's the immediate need, which is not to freeze to death in winter, obviously, and the question of whether or not it's sustainable. Well, the issue of what it is sustainable in the short term, in, in the long term, has been uh, really a matter of discussion. Um, the uh, International Energy Agency has uh, uh, increased the ambition by saying uh, you have to stop anything that is a new fossil uh, investment. But it is also backed by the financial sector. Uh, central banks as well as private banks um, are implementing some measures such that uh, they are going to exclude progressively um, fossil fuels from, from their portfolio. Um, then the question is at which piece we are going to realize this uh, sustainable growth. Um, it's not clear that, that we can reach this objective uh, in the immediate term. So, uh, and the energy crisis is showing that this is not realistic, but it is a signal that is given um, to also to this industry that is embracing the transition, by the way. So we do not have to think that also the oil and gas industry is just waiting for this demand to, uh, to remain very high. They are trying also to decarbonize their assets. Uh, but this is also has and so some your, consequences. What's your religion when it comes to natural gas? Do you still see it as this bridging energy that we need in the short term right now? I think that there is a confusion on the role of gas in the uh, transition in the sense something is true for the electricity markets and uh, uh, there we have this uh, alternative that is investing in uh, renewables and storage as the, the, uh, the other intervenant has uh, clearly assessed it. But on the other point we have to decarbonize the economy and perhaps gas is also useful for decarbonizing transport. It is also useful to store itself energy. So it depends on the usages. Uh, 
I mean, it is not uh, the only thing that we have to do. And in China, it is an alternative to coal. So much more that it can be uh, in France because we there is already the nuclear. So it, the uh, opportunities for gas has to be have to be assessed on a case by case basis. We cannot say that it is a panacea. We cannot say that it is something that we can avoid. And also, I would like to say that there is a, a renewable gas. Uh, it is something that we are, which is quite neglected. Uh, How do you we, make renewable gas? Uh, it, it is gas that is um, made by waste uh, or um, different kind of waste. Uh, and it has the same composition as a fossil fuel gas, so it can be transported and used in the same way. Um, so this is a nice alternative, and also biogas is not intermittent, uh, like uh, wind or uh, solar. So uh, it is not going to have a, an explosion in terms of the, uh, um, the, the gas that we can produce, but still it is a good alternative. Thierry Bros. Yeah, I, I think the crisis today shows us the difference between an Excel spreadsheet or the theory and the practice. Uh, in practice, uh, energy transition, everybody is in favor, but then you have to ask people to reduce their consumption, and they don't. Or to pay more. Or to pay more, and they don't like. Yeah. So I think... Uh, and, and this is why I, I believe in gas, because gas is a backup fuel. Uh, it can uh, come in when there is no uh, renewable. It can uh, do this at normally a but cheaper price. But when Heng says that now you have uh, China, which is buying up the liquefied natural gas that uh, normally used to come our way, does that change your opinion? Yes, it does change my opinion, because uh, as Heng mentioned, uh, we in Europe are blessed with a lot of storage capacity. Uh, and in, in fact, in the old days, until this year, we were able to provide the security of supply, not only of the Europeans, but of the rest of the world. If you remember back a few years ago, when it was very cold in Boston, it was an LNG cargo that was reloaded in Europe that was going into the US. When it was cold in China, it was the same. We can't do this today because we have very low storage levels. So that's, I think... The Why do we have such low storage levels? We have low storage level because uh, the uh, price were quite high even during summer. And again, what we are talking here is something that traders have been aware for a few months. So they gambled. They basically said, well, no, let's, buy, let's buy our gas on the spot market that is immediately rather than plan ahead for the long term. No, I think it was the fact that uh, if you were buying it in summer, you wouldn't be able to pay for the storage cost. And so, therefore, there, was, there is another element, which is a storage cut. And so, therefore, traders were thinking, well, let's not fill in our full storage. And again, there may be some others in the system. Gazprom has some storage capacity, which aren't full in Europe. So, therefore, there may be also other issues there. But if you'd had state pooling of uh, purchases, you wouldn't have had the private sector gambling as to whether or not the price would have gone up or down. Well, um, you can have this in, in a private sector with a long-term contract, which is what Vladimir Putin is saying uh, days and night. You can have a, a nearly a stable price with a long-term oil index contract, which we had. I think that's different. But again, in the toolbox, which I think I, 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 I was not very optimistic about the uh, uh, Soviet buying of gas in Europe, but in the toolbox, there is this uh, ability to uh, put storage level at a certain level in Europe, i.e. a bit like the French law, which uh, mandate people to have 90% of the storage fuel at the beginning of the Yeah, we got a bit of a lecture from Vladimir Putin this Wednesday on that subject. We'll, t we'll hear more from him later on. You're watching the France 24 debate. Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate. We're watching uh, those natural gas prices surge. Same with now oil, coal. We're talking about it with uh, Henning Glostein, Director for Energy, Climate and Resources at the Eurasia Group, who joins us from London, from Goa in India. Sunil Dahia, analyst at the Center for Research on Energy and Clean Air. Anna Kreti, Director of the Climate Economics Chair at uh, Paris Dauphine University, and Thierry Bro, professor at uh, the French Political Science Institute, Sciences Po, member of the EU-Russia Gas Advisory Council. Uh, we're talking about energy, looking at it in terms of supply chains. Uh, purchases in China affect the uh, what happens here in Europe when it comes to energy, too. And globalization means that coal mines 
shut by flooding in China's northern Shanxi province have an impact on prices well beyond the country's borders and in a nation that's uh, confronted right now with rolling powder out outages, the government's hit pause on price caps for electricity. Recently, we're indeed unleashing the capacity of coal production. And the coal mines that are released are all legal and in compliance with regulations. In addition, the release is being advanced with a market-oriented and law-based approach. Uh, Henning Glostein, ahead of the big uh, COP26 uh, uh, summit on uh, uh, climate change. Uh, what are the optics on what's going on right now in northern China? They're bad optics. I mean, you mentioned uh, there's a energy crisis here in Europe, but the problems in uh, especially northeastern China uh, seem to be um, much bigger. They already have blackouts and factory shutdowns. Um, as you said, there's a short coal shortage domestically. It's also a lot of the suppliers of coal to China have had real problems. Indonesia, uh, the world's biggest thermal coal exporter, has had a huge COVID outbreak. Um, uh, so that's uh, impacted as well. Same in Mongolia. So um, uh, China's troubles are, are quite severe. And um, they have a similar issue, though, to Europe. So the long term climate and pollution policy set in Beijing um, doesn't always align very well with the immediate priority locally to provide affordable and reliable electricity. And um, in a situation like now, these things are cra uh, clashing. Yeah, we're, and, we're uh, reading about a, a surge in diesel powered generators for companies. Uh, yep, that is correct. Uh, we've had uh, reports uh, from quite a few countries, especially in South and Southeast Asia, that some of the power generators who used to import LNG or coal have switched to oil fired generation. Um, even Japan is apparently contemplating demothballing old uh, coal fired units just because oil, interestingly, now is relatively cheaper to natural gas or coal, which is a very unusual turn of events. A very unusual turn of events. And in neighboring India, power outages uh, have also been witnessed in places like Punjab, around Mumbai. There's alarm for electricity supplies uh, in the capital uh, itself, uh, with uh, reports that uh, coal-powered plants have less than eight days of supply less. Uh, that's according to data from the Central Electricity Authority of India. Uh, Sunil Dahia, uh, Again, is it a case, uh, again, of, 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 on the one hand, the urgent need, you don't want power outages in the country, but uh, again, the optics of the fact that what you're scrambling for is coal. No, actually, uh, what's happening is this is not a resource crunch. This is a management crunch. Whenever uh, the coal stock at a power plant or at different power plants crumbles, it doesn't happen overnight. It happens over a period, longer, longer period. And all the data of depleting coal stocks at power plants as well as at the mines is being maintained or, or looked at by the government as well as the power producers. Now, because uh, since March or April this year, the coal stock was depleting at the power plant plants gradually and that was not replenished before the monsoons were onset and th that led to monsoons uh, coming and holding uh, more stockage of coal at the power plants and uh, a little bit higher demand compared to last year because last year was a covid year all those factors have cumulatively led to low coal stock uh, uh, at, at the power plants but that doesn't mean that india doesn't have access to uh, more mineable coal or, or doesn't have capacity to mine more more coal we do have more mining capacity. It's a management uh, crisis uh, which has uh, led to this situation. And uh, we, we, we foresee that if, if the go go government uh, manages to uh, work efficiently on this within a couple of weeks or a few weeks, this situation can be under control and everything will be normal. Uh, the only issue which uh, all the examples of China, India, Europe uh, are highlighting is that these countries or all the regions across the world have, have been heavily dependent on the fossil fuels. And this, these are all natural sources which have limited supply. And uh, all these uh, can be controlled or manipulated to increase the power prices. And that's, that's, a, that's a big reminder that we need to shift our energy systems to uh, more uh, cheaper, uh, better and more reliable uh, energy sources which Renewable can provide uh, with the battery storage uh, capacity uh, coming online. 
uh, we have limited financial resources and if those resources are spent on building more coal or more more gas we will definitely not be investing that money into renewable and that's that that's what we need to understand and move away from coal and is the government is is that what the government's doing is the government uh going fast enough towards renewables uh, uh, in India, particularly, uh, we are doing decent on renewable energy. But the, the irony is that while doing decent on, on, on renewable energy, we are, the government money or the public money has been spent on, on, on building new coal-based power plants, or, or the government is also opening up mm. new new coal mines. And that's where uh, we say that this is a wastage of money, which has even a single rupee invested today or single dollar invested today into uh, coal or any other fossil fuel is uh, an investment into a future non-performing asset or, or, or a standard asset which will never be utilized. For example, we did a couple of analysis uh, and found out that in Europe there is about 48 gigawatt of installed excess fossil fuel generation capacity. Similarly, in South Asia, we released a report today all these three countries, India, Bangladesh, and Pakistan, have about 75 gigawatt of excess installed uh, fossil fuel capacity. And just to keep these these, these uh, power plants or this fossil capacity on, we are spending billions of dollars, uh, about uh, 2.3 billion dollars in South Asia, about 30, 33 uh, or, or, or uh, 33 billion has had been spent, uh, would have been spent uh, in excess uh, than what has been already spent if there would not have been renewable energy uh, during July to September uh, period in Europe. So there okay. are huge savings uh, uh, in terms of shifting to uh, renewable energy. And uh, just the uh, last point I would like to make is uh, uh, if uh, 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 renewable energy would not have been there uh, in Europe, particularly uh, between the period of July to September, we would have needed at least 28 uh, gigawatt of installed uh, gas or coal-based power generation which means uh, that capacity running at full steam uh, would have costed, costed us much more at a time when uh, gas prices are skyrocketing. And it is only because of renewables uh, that the, 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 the prices didn't go as high up as they would have been in absence of renewable energy. All right, so, so, uh, so, so renewables already making their impact felt. Uh, Thierry Bros, let me ask you. You know, because how many uh, I, it's you know, there's a presidential election campaign in this country coming up and already everyone's trying to prove their green credentials. But could we be going much faster when it comes to uh, making that energy transition? Well, I mean, it depends how much you want to invest. I mean, the question is how much you can invest and who's going to pay for this? I, I think that's the, the, the element. Uh, where I disagree in, uh, in, in the former uh, re reply was uh, renewable are always cheaper. No, they aren't always cheaper. Uh, I, again, you were talking about biogas. Biogas costs 10 times more than bringing Russian gas in, in, into Europe in, in terms of cost. So I think we have to uh, understand that going into this renewable world is going to be extremely costly. Uh, I think uh, uh, the uh, executive vice president from the commission says it's going to be bloody hard. Uh, and, and again, we have to uh, embark the citizens. We have to say to the citizens, uh, maybe there will be less energy, maybe it's going to be much more expensive. And, and, and we can't tell them it's going to be cheaper and more reliable, because at the end of the day, I view the uh, today's situation exactly the opposite. I think it's because we didn't have enough wind in September in Europe that we had to burn more gas, and so therefore this tightened the gas balance. Henning Goystein, you agree? Not entirely. No, I do not think um, uh, the uh, the gas crunch is down to the low winds. It is true, though, that there were low winds, um, and that is the problem. And uh, renewables are intermittent, and we so far don't really have the mass storage solutions um, available um, available to, to back them up. And that is where natural gas does play a role. Um, I, I, I think if this is an investment lack in, in by into transmission grids and storage solutions. Europe's not the first place to suffer this. Uh, in Australia, there's been power outages in every major city over the last couple of years because they made the same mistake. They um, they haven't invested into the grid. They haven't invested into storage solutions. The Texas power outages last winter, for sure, it was cold. Um, and there was the same blame game. The gas industry uh, blamed the renewable uh, renewable folks and the renewable folks blamed the gas industry. Uh, overall, it was probably fairly poor regulation and underinvestment into the grid. And there are storage. I mean, you mentioned at the start of um, 
this show, maybe collective buying strategic gas reserves. I, I also don't think that's going to happen on an EU basis. But you do have national solutions. I'd take Italy, for instance. I mean, it, Italy is also a highly gas dependent economy, and they have a mandate to, to store a certain amount of all their natural gas imports um, uh, for, for times exactly like this. So they are now suffering high prices, but they will probably not suffer outages like they are at risk in Britain, because here there's very low storage capacity. So I think that's where the problem is. Um, uh, uh, it's an investment into the grid and into storage solutions. Well, let's bring in the Italian in this discussion. Uh, Anna mm -hmm. Creti, uh, the, the so yeah, Italy is going to get through the winter, uh, according yeah, to, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's going to be higher bills. So again, politically, how does that fly? Yeah, I think that, well, <laughs> uh, it is true to that uh, Italy is one of the few countries in Europe that has chosen this idea to have a strategic reserve for gas due to de the dependency of the country uh, on the gas supply. Uh, at the same time, Italy has invest started investing in uh, renewables even before the mandates uh, that, that have been then imposed by the European Commission to diversify the, uh, the mix. Uh, the actual situation is that uh, um, the dependence is, is still there, but the government has been one of the first to take the measures in order to um, alleviate the crisis, uh, especially towards uh, households. So they have uh, actually uh, decided to uh, decrease the, uh, uh, the VAT, as uh, it was uh, one of the suggestions of the European Commission today. Um, and they have put on, uh, on uh, a lot of money uh, for uh, billions uh, in order to uh, um, accelerate the transition in the next months. Uh, and also to, uh, um, uh, to make massive uh, uh, subsidies to vulnerable consumers. Um, so there was something that was already prepared. Uh, given the gas dependence uh, in Italy. Uh, but the, the, uh, the thing is that, well, we can make examples in Spain or in Greece, in other countries. This is Europe. Uh, we have a common goal. We have the Union of Energy. We now have the um, objective of uh, integrating 55% renewables in our energy mix. Um, but, uh, I mean, we, we need a few more years. All right. You should have stocked up on natural gas was actually almost the quote we got from Vladimir Putin in Moscow today at an energy forum. Moscow accused by some of upping the pressure to speed up the launch of the now completed Nord Stream 2 pipeline that bypasses Ukraine. Russia, by the way, also accused of squeezing neighboring uh, Moldova when it comes to gas supplies. At that energy forum, Putin blasting Europe for an over-reliance, again, on spot gas purchases. They should have bought and stocked up when prices were low, he says. I will repeat, the increase of gas prices in Europe was a consequence of electric power shortages and not vice versa. And as we say here, they should not lay the blame at someone else's door, which is what some of our partners are trying to do. Sometimes, as you listen to what is being said in this regard, you're simply surprised. So, Henning Gleustein, is Vladimir Putin correct? Vladimir Putin is, is playing politics here. Um, I mean, one thing in, in Russia's defense, they have over the last decades been uh, actually a fairly reliable gas supply to the European Union. This started during the Cold War. It's um, easy to forget. Um, however, at the moment, they, they don't look particularly great because uh, they have uh, supplies via Ukraine have fallen over the last few years. Um, they say Nord Stream 2 is ready and it is finished, but of course it doesn't have regulatory approval yet. But um, so whether they're playing, uh, not supplying via Ukraine because they want to make a case for Nord Stream 2, that's playing geopolitics with gas, which doesn't look very good. There's also some suspicion um, that uh, Russia is having some trouble um, from its private natural gas producers, where a lot of the gas is associated to oil and there's been oil production cuts um, as part of OPEC plus agreement, and that they just um, uh, haven't uh, filled um, their own storages in time. And then uh, if that is the case, Russia might not be able to fully supply at the moment. Um, so I, I think Russia is in a bit of a, a tight position itself at the moment. It doesn't look particularly good. However, to totally demonize uh, Nord Stream 2 at this stage makes very little sense. That pipeline will be operational next 
year probably. Um, Germany needs it for that matter because it has to retire its remaining six nuclear reactors ne by the end of next year. And if they don't want to put on lignite or hard coal power stations, they're going to need a little bit more gas in the system. So, um, I mean, everyone's getting it very excited at the moment for good reasons and understandable. But um, in, in the end, we will probably be using Nord Stream 2 by next year, but it will not come in time uh, to uh, support this winter right now. Does Europe give up some of its autonomy by purchasing more Russian natural gas, Thierry Bros? Yes, it's, uh, we are more and more dependent. Uh, we uh, are 90% dependent on foreign suppliers for gas uh, today. In France, we include what, Norway, Algeria? Algeria, uh, Norway, Russia, and there used to be uh, the Netherlands, which is not the case any longer. But again, Russia's share today in the European market is 40%. And, and so, therefore, we are at a level where it, it can start to be, become a dominant uh, actor. And so, therefore, we have to look into this in, uh, and, and to make sure. And I don't think Gazprom, by the way, wants to go above those 40% market share. So I think we, we have to deal with this dependency. Again, on the other side, Russia receives a lot of money. I mean, if you look at today's prices, I mean, the wealth transfer today is 10 billion euro per month. Uh, that we uh, Europeans collectively pay to, to Russia, to Gazprom. So it gives you a bit of, of the kind of, of money that's at stake. Uh, but I think that um, what he, what Vladimir Putin was saying was uh, is partially true. I mean, they, Gazprom has a little bit of extra capacity, could push this extra capacity. They have no goodwill, that's for sure. They, they show no goodwill versus the Europeans. But again, on the other side, uh, we've been saying for the last two years, we want a green narrative and we've uh, relabeled natural gas, fossil gas to make them uh, a bit angry about it. So I don't think uh, the, the, we, we, were, we should expect goodwill from Russia on this. One, one final point, I do think that good, extreme high price are not very good for producers at the end of the day. And one thing that producers don't like is blackouts. So I think at the last minute, we will see more Russian gas coming because then Vladimir Putin can show himself as the one that saves us from the blackouts. <laughs> OK, it'll be a good PR move. Yeah, I think us. so. Um, before we go, uh, we had uh, the French president, Emmanuel Macron, on Tuesday, who again is running for re-election soon. Uh, he launched this 30 billion euro innovation plan. He promised two main pillars on energy, an upgrade on nuclear power and... The second objective is to become the leader in green hydrogen by 2030. We are fully committed to this. This really is one of the sectors where we can be the leader. Anna Kreti, that's a great name, green hydrogen. Yes, is it green though? Nice name and also quite a marketing uh, <laughs> campaign. Um, no, it does. Uh, the, the point is that we need hydrogen um, in but order to. But you need to, factories to produce it, so it's uh, not green, is it? First, uh, the, the the interest of hydrogen is that it can decarbonize the industry, which is another. Uh, uh, Macron pointed out that the uh, emission of the industry are too high with respect to uh, what was uh, planned to, uh, in, in, uh, in the uh, strategy national by carbon, so in the uh, national strategy uh, against uh, carbon emissions. Um, but the point is that uh, um, uh, how much does it cost? And uh, is sure that uh, these. Uh, Green hydrogen uh, will be a reality for the moment. It is extremely costly. Okay. Uh, so the process is known. So there is no uncertainty, um, which is, uh, by the way, the case of, of the technology uh, he has mentioned about nuclear. But the point is how much it is going to cost and therefore um, how much we are going to produce. So if natural gas won't save the planet, Henning Gloystein, you're hearing Anna say, it won't necessarily be green hydrogen that will do it either. Uh, we actually think green hydrogen, um, potentially also with blue hydrogen generated from natural gas uh, while uh, getting rid of the carbon out of the system. But we think um, clean hydrogen will be an industrial pillar of most uh, economies in within the next 15 years. 
Um, virtually all leading governments have put their weight into this. In Europe, uh, France, um, today reiterated, was one of the first countries um, that uh, published a hydrogen strategy. The Benelux, Germany, Italy, Spain, Japan, South Korea, now China as well, the Middle East. So there's uh, most engineering companies, most steel makers, most car makers, fertilizing companies, they're all uh, um, investing really heavily into this sector. So it is correct, um, uh, green hydrogen is extremely expensive at the moment, but that I, th I think will be a trend um, where we will see a repeat of what happened in the renewable industry and in batteries. Uh, because keep in mind, these are technologies, so they get cheaper the more we use them and um, the, uh, as they come to scale. And because of all these investments, they will come to scale and they will get cheaper, I think, fairly fast. Um, so we're quite uh, confident and b bullish on our outlook for hydrogen, especially in Europe, actually. All right. Uh, we'll end on that note. Many thanks, Henning Glostein, for being with us uh, from London. I want to thank Sunil Daia for being with us uh, from Goha, Anna Kreti, Thierry Bros. Thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate.